from Cadillac Motor Company. Uh, Travis works for Cadillac. Uh, he's going to be presenting a rich history of the Cadillac automobile. Uh, he's an on-the-road historian, a specialist for Cadillac, and a chief instructor for the CTSB series. And we understand he had a very interesting trip up here to, on our Massachusetts roads, and he probably finds racing a heck of a lot better than driving in Massachusetts. <laughs> but it's a pleasure now to introduce to you Travis Lache. Travis, thank you. A um, couple years ago, I was asked um, to be on the team for the uh, performance B Lab of Cadillac. And I was actually ecstatic about it because I love. Uh, I love their performance division. The V-Series has just been amazing. But I also have a personal love of it because in our family, we've been into Cadillacs for a while. And uh, they didn't know that I have a couple older cars and knew something about the history. Uh, they were doing an interview at one of the V uh, uh, press launches. And one of the big wigs was asked a little bit something about the heritage of Cadillac. And I, you know, I'm always eavesdropping, listening in. He got stumped. He's more about the performance brand. So I swooped in, answered a few questions for him. It was golden. Next thing I know, Amelia Island's coming around. We need someone to act as our heritage specialist. Will you be able to, to do this? I said, I'm a, I'm a dumb driver. I don't know. Geez, holy cow, you know. Um, but had a great, I've been at Amelia Island uh, representing Cadillac now for three years. I've been out to Meadowbrook, and I'll be representing once again at Pebble Beach in their large heritage display that they put up. Uh, and it's been an absolute dream come true for me because they bring a lot of items from the Heritage Museum and we set them up at these Concord and I get to research, learn all about them. There's cars that are brought in from, the, from various owners and uh, get to show everybody and talk about the rich history of Cadillac and everything that goes on. And it's absolutely wonderful. Um, those of you who know the GM Heritage Center, they have an amazing collection of vehicles. Some were rarely brought out and we're able to, to get them out for these. And uh, Greg Wallace does not like to go on the road, so that's why they brought me uh, to do it. And I, I can't believe it. Here I am. You know, so uh, that's a little more about my background and why I'm here. Uh, by no means am I uh, an official historian because I'm so young. I think you really had to live through a lot of what went down. All I can do is research it no more uh, than I possibly can about it, but the thing that intrigues me most, the more that I research, the more I find out, the more people that I talk to, one of my favorite things that's coming to events like this or Pebble or Amelia is finding out people's history that they've had with these cars and why they love the mark and why they love the brand so much. Now, the first 50 years are an amazing time for Cadillac and for the motor automobile industry in general. Uh, at the time, there was uh, a few companies that were making vehicles, uh, making motor cars. There was that whole change from horseless carriage. And uh, it started out that there's a possible industry. People still weren't con convinced that, that a, uh, a horseless carriage was going to be the way to go. There was, uh, it all kind of starts out with Cadillac with a, an individual called uh, Henry. Martin Leyland. He was uh, from the Northeast here. He was actually originally from. Don't get to me. There we go. He was uh, born in Vermont. Uh, he worked in most of New England in Worcester, not too far from here. He worked in Providence. Uh, he was the youngest of a large family, a very uh, Catholic-based family. He was. A very uh, wise individual, started working at 11 years old, and he got into anything involving precision and manufacturing. It was his true passion of, uh, of anything that he wanted to do. He ended up working for, uh, to name one that we all know, was uh, the Colt Firearms Company. He worked for Colt, and Colt had uh, interchangeable parts, one of the first handguns, uh, firearms. And the sole concept of interchangeable parts was something that was really only carried over to from watches and now like firearms. Uh, rather interesting stuff for him to learn. He worked for a lot of these different companies. Uh, from there, he went to a company called uh, Brown and Sharp, 
and uh, they were big into uh, gauges. Yeah. To, uh, excellence, the gauges. They had uh, the vernier, uh, they had micrometers, vernier rules. Um, it just was really amazing stuff to have that technology and that precision starting in the late 1800s. Um, when uh, Henry Leyland was uh, was working for all these all these companies, he always wanted to branch out on his own. But every time he got close, something would happen with <coughs> illness or a family member or uh, chasing a woman. Uh, he moved from a couple areas and, and uh, ended up with his wife, uh, which is why he left, left Colt. And uh, he just was in, always in search of becoming his own, uh, his own boss for the sole reason of being able to do something his way. He always wanted to improve upon existing methods, come up with a better way to do something. The, uh, the chance finally came when he uh, moved to Detroit. And while I was in Detroit working for uh, a manufacturer, uh, he was make, making friends here and there. And he met a guy through another uh, friend that he had at work, uh, a guy named Falconer. And he was a very pretty wealthy for the time, lumber lumberman from northern Michigan. And he really <coughs> liked what uh, Henry Lean was all about, felt that they had a lot to do together and offer. So at that point, uh, Faulkner thought that there was a, a huge need with the growth of industry in Detroit to have machine shops. And at that point, there was 200,000 something manufacturing plants in industry, <coughs> uh, that type of industry, and there was no uh, there was no real major machine shops. There were six or so that were known. So there was a huge, uh, he felt there was a huge demand for it. So they ended up uh, going into business together and basically uh, Faulkner was the, funded the capital to get things off and going and Leland uh, started working on his, uh, his uh, precision manufacturing. It didn't take long that in Detroit that, uh, that Harry Leyland got a reputation for being uh, an amazing uh, machinist, uh, tool, uh, tool maker, the uh, industry came to him whenever they had uh, needed appraisals done for putting together business plans, uh, selling off companies, uh, to see what manufacturing which materials were available. So he became quite, uh, quite a busy man and uh, quite desired man. A lot of people came to him when they had problems that they couldn't solve. At the time, there was uh, his first real claim to fame that really got the big boost was for the bicycle industry. There was various bicycle industries. Uh, one, uh, Pierce, which became the, the Pierce uh, Motor Car Company, they were making bicycles and they were having problems with their gears. Every time they had to make gears or work on gears, they had to hand, uh, take a, an individual that had to hand uh, file them to get them to work. And that's how a lot of manufacturing happened back in the turn of the century with this, is a lot of things had to be done specifically for that one piece of equipment. It became very, uh, very costly. So they came to uh, the man himself, uh, Henry Leland, who they had heard about, and he came up with precision cut hardened gears that were interchangeable. Taking that idea that he had from uh, working within the gun company and came up with uh, these, these gears that they can, you can put them on any of the bicycles. So Pierce and Pope bicycle companies, both huge orders, they were off and running, things were going great. Uh, Henry Leland was then approached by Ransom E. Olds of Oldsmobile about a problem that they were having with their transmissions. He had started building uh, motor cars and selling them, but uh, you know, that's the start of it, why it was getting such a bad reputation is the unreliability uh, and the trouble of getting these, ve these vehicles fixed if there was a problem. Nobody really knew what was what. You had to bring it back to the manufacturer. So uh, Ransom Eold approached uh, Henry Leyland, talked to him about, we need to do something. Henry Leyland designed a whole transmission using that technology that he was working on for the bicycles, hardened gears. Um, everything was interchangeable. Uh, things can be repaired. If there's a problem with it, you can just grab the part, have the part put in, instead of bringing the whole thing back and having it uh, handmade. Through that, uh, Ransom Eold said, well, geez, can you do our motors for us? So sure enough, uh, the guys at LNF 
they, uh, they came up with an amazing one cylinder motor uh, off of the original Olds design. And uh, at that time, Olds was getting motors from both the Dodge brothers and from uh, Leland and, and Buckner. And they, uh, they had a, just a, a superior, superior engine over the, the Dodge brothers. The, a lot of the technology that was being put into motor cars at the time was coming from the farm. So a lot of things were hand, hand done, uh, crude forging, and uh, the foundries weren't very uh, successful. So L and F actually opened up their own foundry next to their machine shop. So now they had really their one-stop shopping with all this. The uh, engine was done on a test side by side with the Dodge Brothers motor, and they came up with 0.7 horsepower more than the Dodge Brothers. Three horsepower compared to 3.7. Not a lot of horsepower in today's standard, but back then, it really was something else. Um, not to mention how much quieter, how much more seamless the engine ran, it was a huge difference. At that point, they felt, we can take this one step further. So what they did is, the, everybody, all the engineers that, that Henry had been working with, and he had some of the best people he hired in from, uh, from other companies that he worked for, from Brown and Shaw, from Cole, uh, had them out there with, with them at L and F, they came up with improvements upon that motor to getting it up to be 10.25 horsepower. So a jump from three horsepower to 10 horsepower. They were ex absolutely ecstatic as you can imagine at that point. It's huge developments out of an existing product. What Henry Leyland loves to do is improve upon uh, a method that he already had going on. This one, how did he measure horsepower? Okay. They actually had dynamometers over back then. In other words, Yep, they had, uh, it was uh, uh, on the big wheel on the side of the one longer there, on those one, one cylinder motors, they had a belt that went into, and they would actually rate horsepower with resistance on this, oh, this right. crude yeah. dynamo. So it's kind of like an engine dyno, yeah. you know, way back in the day. <coughs> uh, the, uh, the Oldsmobile company didn't want the motor. They were fine. They said, no, we've got 4,000 orders we have to fill. We're, our motor, the motor you do for us is fine. We want nothing to do with the expense of retooling and having to work rework chassis and do what we have to do to put that motor in there. So, uh, obviously, disappointment amongst the uh, the L and F people. They had this amazing motor uh, and nobody really to roll with it. And at that point in Detroit, there was a lot of uh, you can call them shady tree, but you know backyard type places that were starting to put together uh, motor cars and try to sell them off and. Uh, Nobody was really had the, the, the uh, backing, except for Ransom E. Olds, to be able to do something like this. And the fact that he turned it down, they had this motor sitting around. Well, uh, lucky for Henry Leland, in August 2nd of 1902, he was approached uh, by two uh, individuals, two guys named Murphy and Bowen. They had contacted uh, Henry Leland because they were going to be liquidating a motor car plant that they had for the last few years that was unsuccessful. So they contacted Henry to do an appraisal on all the equipment that was located at the uh, at the plant and the plant itself in order to do for sale, which was definitely something that Henry was, was known for doing. And he went to the plant, saw the plant, did the appraisal sheets. Got everything squared away, but he was thinking, they have, a ch they have a chassis. They have a car that was built there. He was just, it, it, why was it not, why were they getting out of this? This was, he was so convinced that this was the dawn of this, this new era of the motor car was gonna be the future. So at that point, he thought, well, what if I, what if I can convince them to put this motor in that car? Come to find out that that car was from the Detroit, Auto, the Detroit Automobile Company, which Murphy and Bowen had started along with a, uh, a pretty well-known engineer at the time and a, a rather savvy mechanic, Henry Ford. This is where that tie comes where people hear that, you know, which came first, the Cadillac or the Ford, that whole thing. Uh, and really what, in my research, what I've come up with is that Henry Ford designed this chassis, made this chassis, and Henry Leyland perfected upon it by having this power plant, which made this chassis go uh, as seamless as it was. At the time, he had an Oldsmobile 
at his uh, the LM plant that had this new motor in it. They took the new motor out of the old mobile, put the, the regular boat motor back in the old mobile, drove down to Murphy and Bowen to present them with the appraisal sheets. And this motor, this big heavy one longer, they drove them all down and they went into uh, the offices there at Murphy and Bowen and they said, sirs, I've prepared these sheets for you as you wish for your appraisal, but I think you're making a great mistake. There's a huge opportunity here. We have this motor. And they were kind of blown out. They just look in the liquid. They were at uh, they were at wit's end with Henry Ford. Henry Ford didn't want to have anything to do with a you know vehicle manufacturing company. He was into racing cars. He wanted to build these cars to compete in auto racing, which was a big Playboy thing at the time, really, that people were, you know, as a new frontier. Um, whereas Murphy and Bowen wanted to can make, make a profit, let's sell cars, let's, let's get on this industry off and going. And uh, after three years of being unsuccessful working with Henry Ford, uh, he, had, he had left, they had another engineer that came in to replace him, that was unsuccessful, they were fed up. Um, they knew Leyland's reputation, so they worked very closely to, to listen to him and say, okay, this is, there's, a, there's potential here. Leyland boasted about how his motor was not only the most horsepower by far, but also was not temperamental. Imagine the chuckles that you heard in the room trying to tell this group at that time of, 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 uh, of, the, uh, of the start of the dawn of the automobile that this thing was not going to be temperamental. Unheard of at that point. Basically, if you had a motor car at that time, it was very difficult to drive, start, and nearly impossible to work on. You had to almost be an engineer yourself to, uh, to do anything with it. But they agreed. They said, all right, we'll give it a shot. We have, we have everything, so they reorganized. And what name do you think they chose? Cadillac. They chose Cadillac. And why would they choose Cadillac? Explorer. There was an Explorer. 200 years prior, they had just gotten over celebrating the bicentennial of the founding of Detroit by a French explorer that came down from Canada called Antoine de la Mont Cadillac. And uh, this is where it gets a little difficult. I don't want to get too involved in that aspect of how De Detroit was founded. He was revered at the time as, you know, oh my God, an amazing explorer, this, that, whatever. And then there's other accounts saying that that wasn't even really his name. He wanted to make himself sound a more regal working in the, in the French military and government that he'd get these grants. So he actually took the Cadillac name from a tiny little town that was discovered in the 1200s uh, in south, uh, southwestern France. And his neighbor where he grew up, uh, last name was uh, Le Mans. So he put all these together. Though that, that part is true. Um, he, was, he was revered as an amazing pioneer and, and a huge uh, he's a hero in Detroit in those early years. Whether he really was that good of a guy, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dive into that. That's a whole other seminar in itself of what we got going down. All we do know is though he did take a, a bunch of canoes with fur traders and Indians, and he went down was now <coughs> to the Detroit River and founded on the shores, uh, set up a fur trading location. And that was, you know, that he sent back to France that he has found this amazing location. Everything's coming together. It's a perfect location for trade, this, that, whatever. Um, so that's where the Detroit was founded in, in, uh, in 1701. So no better, no better way than to start a car company in Detroit and name it after the founder of Detroit, which they just celebrated this bicentennial. So. Pretty, uh, actually pretty cool. The, uh, the name <coughs> Cadillac is now <coughs> known throughout the world for quality and precision motor cars. But does anybody even know that there was ever even a little, a little township in France that was called Cadillac? No, so the name really, uh, really the, the, this myth behind it was really something special. Uh, not many car companies have such a neat start like that. 
at such an amazing era when you didn't know if this was even going to take off. The, uh, the original crest that, uh, that they decided on was this one, Le Mans Cadillac. That was Antoine LeMay de Le Mans Sewer. He had all different names, whatever made it sound fancier. Uh, and this was a depiction of uh, when they landed upon shore in Detroit. Uh, a lot of my pictures that I've, I've, uh, I've put together for you guys, I've pulled from books that I know of, <coughs> websites, all that stuff. I didn't draw it, just so you know. But I think it's a good thing you guys have a visual on all the different things that we're, uh, we're talking about here. So there's our, our one longer. We talked a little bit about the history. Well, history goes alongside with kind of like with innovation. So for, the, for a lot of what I'm going to talk about now, it's not only the historic events that's happened within Cadillac's history, but also the innovation, which they kind of really go hand in hand. This was that motor that put out 10 horsepower, 30 miles per hour, 25 miles per gallon, which is really something else back then when it was very hard to get petrol or gasoline, anything to make this internal combustion motor work. Um, that came out in 1902 when they started for the 1903 model year. They put together two 1903 runabouts, Model A runabouts, and brought them to the, uh, the New York Auto Show in 1903. One of their marketing guys, uh, really, really had some amazing marketing people on top of having these, uh, these engineers. They, uh, they took over 2,000 orders already with the reputation of people seeing the cars, just seeing it in person made it so much more far superior than, have you ever looked into some of these early auto shelves from 1900 pictures from them? It's really wild stuff. Some of them look like they're supposed to have a horse in front of them. There's really not much at all except for a motor that they're sitting underneath of. So there was some style, there was a, there was a lot of uh, a lot of cleanliness and precision. Precision. I love to use the word because it's it, that's what he was, his life is based upon. Uh, Henry Leyland. Uh, it made such a huge bang. They took over 2,000 orders for a company just starting out. I mean, granted, you know, LNF was a very successful uh, company and, and had a you know a very large uh, layout uh, in plant, but still, this was a monster order. They filled. 1,895 of those orders for 1903. So by the end of 1903, they, that's, they came out of the gates and they were running. So that right there was an impress, impressive feat. Um, some of the, some of the first that Cadillac has come up with have just been something that we take for granted. When did that actually start? And uh, the first concept car, was Cadillac. This wasn't produced right away, but in 1905, uh, this actually was Henry, Henry Leyland's personal vehicle up through the 30s, and they used it on the farm, and the kids would beat around on it, and it's been restored, and it's uh, it's still in existence. Uh, was wild because it was the first car with a fully enclosed body. Back then, it wouldn't you wouldn't be fully enclosed. Um, so the fact that it was a concept car and that it was fully enclosed, it really was it was something to behold when you saw this in person. It was like nothing else um, that they had come up with. Now, the, the struggle with a lot of what went on in these early years, I'm sure you've heard various stories with other manufacturers and other plants in general. Uh, these big plants, with these hot boundaries, there was a lot of fires. There was a lot going on. So to be able to pull off production that they did, do the stuff that they did, was a, was a feat in itself. But also, they most companies went through completely uh, plants completely burning down, and that actually happened uh, after 1903 out there at the plant. The fact that that first motor that was a first in itself, that an engine had interchangeable parts, was an amazing feat. By the time uh, they got to about 1904, 1905, the model years there. The cars themselves, every Cadillac that was sold, all the parts were interchangeable. Now, I love this story. Have you ever heard of the, uh, of the Dewar Trophy? It was the British uh, had a, every year they put out a challenge that someone you know, could try to fulfill. And uh, for that year, they were looking for a standardization of parts. 
and this was taken way beyond what they were expecting. Uh, another great uh, businessman and marketer uh, took three of these vehicles, three of these runabouts over uh, over to, to England and entered them in this, this Duber Trophy Challenge. They took all three cars completely apart in three separate garages. They took uh, close to, I think, 800 something components from all three, basically jumbled them up in a big pile, and then took some off shelves from suppliers in, in, in uh, England and made them put the cars back together and see if they're in. So within 24 hours, the next day, all three Cadillacs were put together with random parts. All of them did a 500 mile road test. One of them even went on to compete in a 2,000 mile uh, road rally, which it won also there. And never, everything fit perfectly. It was just, oh my goodness. You can have a manufacturer in Detroit that sells their stuff overseas and the parts are off the shelf. If you broke something, you can go to a supplier and fix it. And it was rather simple. But you know, these early days, you actually had to live near the manufacturer where you got your car because if it broke, you had to take it back and they had to remake that part specifically for yours. It doesn't fit. They had to file it away. It doesn't fit. They had to file it away. I mean, it, you know. So this 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 whole concept was first shattered. And at the time, the, uh, the British were a little bit you know high on their horse about how well that their manufacturing was and, and uh, the fact that this happened and that they won. Not only the first, uh, it was the first American company to ever, and the only American company to ever win this coveted Dewar, uh, Dewar's Trophy. And that's where the standard of the world comes from, was from the standardization uh, of parts, interchangeable parts. Now what's funny is, uh, I'm gonna get the quote exact because it's really, when, uh, when Henry Leland was at uh, Brown, uh, was at Brown and Sharp, in manufacturing, their, they were their, had such a great reputation, their marketing was the world's standard of accuracy. So whether that you know, played a part in the standard of the world, I don't know. That's for us to, to kind of think is, maybe it is, maybe it's not. At that time, was there any other cars on the market in 1908? Oh, there were tons, hundreds, of so hundreds, oh, all right. everywhere. Yeah. You know, for 20 years prior to this, uh, you know, the Benz company was making, okay. was producing cars. You had Oldsmobile, Dodge Brothers were now at this time making those. Henry Ford was in full swing. You know, everything was, okay. it was, and they were everywhere. And that's what I was saying. Like every, if you were in a town that was a pretty popular town, you could have seven or eight vehicle companies there because that's going to, you can drive. You had to drive what they had because if it broke, they had to fix it. This was now allowing this to branch out. Sure which is why an American company being over in Europe and their cars being used for that was just, you know, was an amazing thing to have happen. 1909, General Motors uh, was already in full swing, owned Buick at the time, uh, they bought out Oldsmobile. Uh, they bought Cadillac. They tried three times to buy Cadillac. A guy named William Crapo, believe it or not, during it, uh, that was his name, was trying to buy Cadillac because he wanted the manufacturing so he could spread it throughout all of his General Motors. He was buying up all the car manufacturers that he felt were rather successful. He wanted Cadillac so bad because of Leyland and his, uh, and his crew and how he could really make you know, General Motors the largest vehicle conglomerate in the world. First time he tried, four, 4.1 million, I think he tried to get it for. They turned him down. He made an offer that was five hundred thousand dollars too le too little. Six months later, he tried to make another offer. At that four point seven million, they turned him down. They said no. Now it's five point six million, because at that time Cadillac was gaining so much reputation and so much steam and growing and growing and growing, and it was just an absolute superpower <coughs> that uh, that Durant had to have. So he coughed up 5.6 million, mostly in stock, but a lot of cash did go to Leyland on that one. Uh, Leyland was made of, of, of one of the principals, uh, had pretty much control over uh, everything at Cadillac still. 
Uh, and at that time, it was the biggest transaction the Detroit Stock Exchange had ever seen. I can't fathom, in 1909, $5.6 million. That's like now like a bazillion, quadrillion dollars. You know, it's, it's, it's out of this world. Um, but what was the name of the company that went from New York to California? That was also a famous company in that 1900 era. There was a name of a company, I don't remember what the name was, but in that era, they, had a, they, they went from uh, California to New York. And um, got all kinds of problems. Olds was in there. It was, it was, it was, it was a drive from California to New York. <coughs> oh, oh, oh. Drive from California yeah. to New York. Where Olds was in there, and Cadillac was in there, and there was another company. It was a, a very good quality company. Uh, Chrysler. No, Chrysler was no, Chrysler. No, Walter Chrysler was later. No. There was another company in 1899. And it went from California to New York. In 1899, you wouldn't even have had Cadillac then. It would have just been probably uh, Olds, or at that point, the uh, I know the Dodge brothers were trying to put together well, some. Dodge brothers was the money people for Ford. They were really bankers. The Dodge, they lent money to Ford in that era. And Ford and Dodge brothers didn't get along, so they split. Horace Dodge and uh, Ford Company split because they wouldn't get along with Henry Ford. But there was another company that was a famous company that went from, like I say, from California to New York. No, I don't know that one. You don't know that no. one at all. Tell me on that one. That's when the Pontiac joined GM. That was later. Yeah, that was uh, that was definitely later. Don't. Yeah, I don't uh, don't know much for that. I, I try try to keep my my knowledge uh, honed in on stuff because it's very easy. You know, especially when you get involved with, uh, when I work for other manufacturers, but I'm also a, a driver for Jag and, uh, and Audi and Lamborghini and Bentley, and, and all of a sudden you start talking about pre-work Bentleys, and I don't want, you know, it's like everything starts to, starts to melt together. 1909, they came up with the world's first Linden. Pretty, uh, pretty amazing uh, how much that resembles a lot of what we know uh, of limousines throughout the, the golden age, 30s, the 40s, the 50s, uh, having the, the open compartment for the driver with like closed and luxurious uh, accommodations for uh, for the occupant. And then 1910 was the first time that a fully enclosed car was offered as a standard vehicle. Now, a baseline car, every you know, every Tom, Dick, and Harry was able to get an enclosed car. Where before, they suffered in the elements. It was only the high end that had uh, that had these enclosed cars. Also during that time is when the Delco coil uh, and the uh, breaker point ignition system started coming through, increasing the reliability and the ease of these vehicles. Uh, Delco was uh, a company in Dayton, Ohio. It's uh, they, were they owned by GM or they were separate corporations? No, they were separate at that time. They were trying. They were so trying to get in with Cadillac. They kept coming to Cadillac with these with these innovations. Uh, and Leyland would do a lot of tests and work with his engineers. You know, for Magneto. I think Delco was a Magneto maker. So there were a lot of different things. They actually did cash registers. They did a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, Delco was a Dayton Electric Laboratories company. The... Uh, <coughs> <clears throat> the next big thing, which earned them a second, remember how we said before, Cadillac was the only American car company to ever win a Dewar Trophy. Now, they're the only manufacturer to ever win two in the world. It's all because of the self-starter. Has anybody ever uh, crank-started a car before? My father drove the car. That was that's the common thing. Believe it or not, Henry Leland had a friend of his that died from complications from an injury trying to start a car, a Cadillac, for a woman <coughs> that was uh, one of her uh, one of the assistants driving on the Belt Isle Bridge. The car stalled in the winter. Uh, one of his uh, associates stopped and helped the woman. She had not returned the spark. When he went to fire it up, it kicked back and injured him so badly 
that he actually ended up dying from complications from that injury. Henry Leland was completely crushed, and at that point, in 1911, it was, we have to come up with a better way. <coughs> Delco at that time had been working on using uh, uh, compressed air to start a vehicle. Big, huge canisters on the side of the huge compressed air that we try to start it. Leyland didn't like any of them, not, not to his standard. So they eventually came up with the, uh, the electric self-starter. Also at that same time while working on this, they worked on an ignition system and also came up with electric lights. No more light in the gas, you know, trying to get, the, get your lights flickering in the, uh, in the breeze there. So um, uh, just a lot in 1912, look, at me, look back to what we talked 10 years prior, it was just a motor, with a, a couple fenders and a couple wheels. Now we've got these vehicles that are being closed vehicles, the electric lights, starters, ignitions, magneto, everything. Magneto's been a thing in the past. I worked with the self-starter. was actually a generator on top of being the self-starter, so they didn't build magnetos anymore. Just awesome stuff. You know, people tend to forget also, too, they think about this modern age with all the electronics and all with all the internet and stuff like that and how things have moved so rapidly. But if you look back in that era and realize the tools they had to move things rapidly, they move pretty damn rapidly. I, I couldn't even imagine. I, 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 just luckily, we've had some some interesting things in my generation that have happened that we can look back and tell our kids, I was there when you know this happened and that happened. But I, to live and grow up in that generation where you went from no electricity, no anything, to all of a sudden seeing what they've gone through. Uh, you know, my even my grandmother unfortunately she's passed away. We had conversations before she passed of all the things that she saw and what she went through, and it just it gives me goosebumps to even think back. It's the stories that she talked about, how things were, and how things were when she passed away. I, it's mind-boggling. So I'm sure she felt that anything was possible at that point. Nowadays, uh, yeah, sure, we've got tons of technology coming out, but if you really throw it together in a big lump, it's, sure, it's a bunch of electronic technology, but stuff like this, though, in 10 years, how fast things have happened? Um, 1914. Cadillac first to swing away the it's steering wheel. Fat boy. Yep. The, the fat man wheel. And uh, yeah, I've jumped on the 1902 runabout, <coughs> and I'm skinny. But I'm tall. So I'm tall. You know, actually, Henry Leland was very tall for him. He was almost six feet tall. He's a very tall man. Very, that's why he has such amazing presence. Um, but it, it is absolutely. And then I sit down, and the wheel is is right here. So I couldn't imagine if I had an extra 20, 30 pounds, I couldn't drive this thing. Once I, well, maybe I can get into it once I got into it, but having this, this swing away steering wheel that would actually come back up, as simple as this may seem in design, it was a very important thing to have happen that day uh, for people getting out and also getting um, anybody if you had to get through seats and all that, depending on what model you had set up. 1915. First armored car, but the first mass produced, not the first V8, the first mass produced V8 engine. It was a 314 cubic inch, 70 horsepower, but what made it so amazing, not only that it was a V8, it was the largest motor uh, that you could get at that time, and that the, 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 the layman can have that motor. It wasn't just a high-end person that had that motor. It had a thermostatic to control water cooling system. Biggest problem that was going on at that point where vehicles were overheating, and that's what was killing engines. Here, this is pretty much what we're using for most modern technology now. It's having that thermostat in there that gets the things going through. Looks more like a showing machine than a motor. Uh, 1917, uh, Henry Leland finally had enough. Uh, William Crapo Durant of the GM company, uh, even though it was his company, initially was voted off the board for a while, back on, he was back around. He came back in in 1916, back with the, uh, the board of GM, and uh, Leyland and, and his son uh, Wilfred had had enough. They, uh, they had a huge dispute between what Cadillac should be doing with the war effort. Henry Leyland was very patriotic. He wanted to do all he could for World War I, and uh, wanted to start doing uh, doing stuff. Uh, many people at the time were not for the United States getting involved in World War I, and uh, Durant was one of those, and he wanted nothing to do with the war effort. So uh, that 
That's when Henry Leyland left and started the Lincoln Motor Company, um, where his first uh, his first involvement was was actually putting together stuff for the war effort before he even started working on car stuff. Now you didn't mention that 15 was the first self-started. We did that. We did that already. Yeah. Yep. We did that. Very self started Yeah. Um, in uh, in Europe and the United States, many manufacturers chose Cadillac as their official cars. So even though um, Cadillac didn't, you know, the Durant, the GM didn't want to get involved in uh, in the war, they were involved in the sense because their cars were used everywhere. Everywhere, other foreign countries had them. Canada, uh, France, um, United States, all the branches of the U.S. military were using them because of their reliability, because of their dependability. Um, they were bodies were taken off and beds were put on for hauling uh, equipment, lights, anti-tank stuff. It, it, it was just huge involvement, in it, even though they didn't want to. Uh, it was at that point that uh, Henry Leyland with the Lincoln started doing uh, stuff for the Allison company, started providing all the engine components for the Allison, uh, Allison motors that they were using in the airplanes. 1922. I really couldn't find a great picture that showed <laughs> the wiper in the rear view mirror. So I saw, this is the rear view, and that's the wiper. <laughs> you got kind of but kind of a neat year. Uh, small thing we take for granted, but um, having a standard windshield wiper. Every car came with a windshield wiper and a mirror. That's like vanity. That, that was something else for a standard car to have that. Uh, also at that time, they came up with a thermostatically controlled fuel mixture. At that time, on the steering wheel, you were always adjusting the car, trying to get, you know, adjusting car to spark, which everything was always, now you have to worry about it. All you have to worry about is pulling a choke when you start it, once you up the temperature, you're all done. So another thing, we have great ignition systems, cooling systems, starting systems, fuel systems, <coughs> really was taken off. That is 1922 Caddy. 1923, uh, the V8 was an amazing motor, but it was still, it had a flaw. It had a really bad vibration at a certain RPM, uh, as did anybody else that was trying to put together V8s. Nobody had solved what was going on with the uh, with the vibration that these motors came to them. When, when a motor vibrates, what happens to some of the internals? You get some damage in there. So they, this was something they had to they had to sort out right away. Uh, and they did come up. They put up a, a dual plane uh, counterbalance crankshaft, and uh, the drawing was very primitive. But uh, the one thing that was also really cool is that year they had started using lacquer paint, and now everything on the road is black. Now, this is where really we started to set a Cadillac apart. They were the first one to use uh, lacquer paints to come up with all these amazing colors. So, uh, and, you know, 1923, that really was kind of getting the start of that real glamorous era of people who wanted to take advantage of that. 1927, great year, uh, LaSalle was started. Other manufacturers that were, uh, the three Ps that were battling with Cadillac for vehicle supremacy had, uh, had some more entry-level vehicles with six owners in them. Uh, Packer Company, for example, was really ruling the market at that time with having a six-cylinder or a base model car. Cadillac didn't want to tarnish their name that they had, so they started a another company which used most of the technology and then some uh, of what uh, Cadillac had and called it LaSalle. LaSalle was the first car that was ever designed by a designer. Although that's, that's all we know now is that all cars are designed by designer and then the engineers make it happen. It was never that case. That's why the LaSalle's were, even though they were supposed to be less expensive vehicles, they were beautiful. They had really, they really welcomed in that Art Deco era. Uh, everything about them flowed so wonderfully. They looked amazing, the colors, uh, just beautiful cars. And that engineer, anybody ever heard of Harley Girl? No, nobody has it. Uh, in 1928, they came out with the, uh, the clashless gearbox, the synchro mesh silent shift transmission. What was wild about that, uh, as any of us can imagine, driving a car that doesn't have a synchro mesh transmission 
is very difficult. And it's especially difficult when, back when people were now jumping on the bandwagon and buying cars up in bulk, very hard to drive. You could do a lot of damage by not getting the gear shifts right. And most of the time, salesmen, uh, you know, the, 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 the teens, the 20s, they were also the first driving instructors. Because to sell this car, they had to actually teach them how to drive it also. They had to teach not only the, the farmer, his, all of his hands that worked there, his kids, so his kids know how to drive it. So having a, 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 a synchro mesh gearbox that you didn't need to match revs perfectly and you know, get the throttle up to get it back down in gear made this a lot more drivable for other people. Now, what did the self-starter help? People didn't have to be strong. Right. So women, younger people, all that, they were able to, to get these things running. But the shifting was very difficult. Now, having a self-starter and having you know, a synchromesh gearbox, this opened the world for so many people to be able to drive these vehicles. Also that year, safety glass was introduced. That was a 1929. They used the double clutch yeah. to drive the transmission. You had to put the clutch in twice. Oh yeah. And put it in mass the rev to get it back out. Go into, mm -hmm. into, into the synchro mesh situation. Yeah. It was a big, big problem. When it got worn a little bit, but it was like a year or six months, the gears wouldn't go into it without the synchro mesh. Especially when it got cold out too. So it became really yeah. impossible to drive. And the radiators were a big problem. So radiators was an awful problem. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't get up anything to clear out the, the presto. They didn't have presto in those years. Uh, so there was no way in the winter. The radiators used to freeze and break. Yeah. And then they came in, everybody came in with the presto. And uh, presto would go into the radiator and save the radiator. Otherwise, you have to drain the water out because they would crack the block. Mm -hmm. There was a whole bunch of cracked blocks in those days. Yeah. It was a big problem cracking the blocks. Mm -hmm. Well, 1930, something unheard of. A manufacturer came out with a V16 engine. Can you Mom. imagine at that point? Mom. Couple, well, Marvin had a, uh, had toyed around and they had a V16 that was not, it wasn't the same manufacturer and they also wasn't mass produced. But this was the first one for passenger cars. The Marvin ones were used in in other applications. 452 cubic inches, 160 horsepower, and have you seen these motors in person in cars in the open hood? That's the way they work. That was part of Harley Earl wanting that, you know, it shouldn't just be the, the outside of the car or the, the interior. You should open that motor, everything, that, that art deco area, just the, every detail. Gorgeous, gorgeous motors. Um, I had a couple of great pictures of the various V16s that I've had in my possession when I was doing uh, some of these events, but they had too much in the background, but they do look a lot like this. The the, the, uh, the ceramic coatings on the chrome that was used, the aluminum was polished, just absolutely gorgeous stuff. Not soon, not too far after this, Cadillac introduced a few months later the V12, a lot like this, uh, a little bit smaller displacement, and uh, it just blew the world away because what was going on in 1930? The pressure. Great, great pressure. pressure was starting. Great Depression. Right. The crash was going to be nine. Oh my God! What's going to you know? Why would they come out with this motor? You know what? They still sold over 2,500 the first year. So there was still that. I must be the the people that were unaffected by what was going on there. 1934. Uh, I love the 1934. Very hard to find because a couple things. Well, the first one is their independent front suspension. That's a huge. Huge, huge, huge thing to have happen with these heavy, large vehicles to, to have that independent front suspension. You can see how they're using the lever type shocks, but the way that they're set up, it didn't affect the car as much. I'm sure the, you guys know the roads weren't all that great back in the, uh, back in the 30s. Um, but I love the 34 because the 34 was when you really started to get the flow of these cars. The cars that we, you know, that we just, you know, put up on pedestals. You know, the cars of the early 30s were beautiful. The fenders were, looked like they were more stamped out there. They were added on later. Now you're, the 34 vehicles were looking so much more involved body work wise. 
1937, uh, Cal Excel engine V8 set a uh, uh, set a new speed endurance record at 8,500, averaging 82 miles per hour. That there is the uh, that was the official pace car for that year uh, because it's the significance of having during that event that the uh, the speed record endurance record was was held at that point. I just did a cool cool picture. Guy's got the hat. He's all set. Um, Cadillac was the first one to bring our modern day idea of sunroofs to America. A couple of European companies had, uh, had done some stuff, but this was the first time it was called the Sunshine Turret Top that was available. Uh, and believe it or not, not many people ordered them. Very few cars have them. Uh, very hard to find one nowadays too that has them. The other thing that was kind of funky uh, was the first concealed spare tire. That was a hard one to come up with. Not many, not many, not actually none of the books that I've even been reading through ever talked about that. Uh, that one was one that I was at a couple of these events and had cars side by side and saw, and I, I did find some stuff online and in an in obscure book about that that was the official first year. Um, you know, obviously we know they were mounted in the rear, but they were also a lot of the side mounts. If you had dual side mounts, you know, that was a thing of prestige. But now, hiding that tire away led to better lines on the car. The cars will look even uh, even more beautiful. But, you know, I prefer the dual side mounts. I have oh. a car without, same car, yeah. one with, with dual side mounts and one without. And yeah, no, absolutely. Control the dual side mounts any day. I have a 39 Packard also, <coughs> and it's got the, the hidden spare, and there's no trunk space. The way the trunk is, it has to come up. It makes the trunk chunkier. Side mounts would be great. Wow. Now, that was the first year 38 of the V16 flathead engine. <coughs> yes. Now, now the V16 flathead engine was the first, you were 39, but the first 38, 39, and 40, they made it for three years, the car that I have. I have three V16 flathead engines. I have a 38 convertible coupe, I have a 38 V16 convertible sedan, and I have another 38 V16 convertible sedan. Yep. I have Franklin Delano Roosevelt's car in 1938. Oh, fantastic. Bring him here? No, not here. No, no. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, so I have it also. They made a 165 inch wheelbase, and it was a V16 convertible sedan with jump seats in it. Mm -hmm. So they only made two of those cars with the division window with jump seats. I have one of those too. And the other one was uh, maybe they say an Imperial Palace of the two cars made of the V16 convertible sedan. So I have three V16 open cars. Well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the 39 V16, which is actually what Cadillac supplied uh, most of the engine parts to Allison to make this. And you know, those those engines were uh, really what, uh, what helped us uh, help us along in World War II. 1940, anybody, everybody uh, know about the first year Olds, Olds was of the 1938? The they were the first automatic, but they were not the first fully automatic transmission. That was the hydromatic here. Uh, also that year was the introduction of the recirculating ball steering box. The hydromatic was one more of those luxury items. Everybody wanted automatic at that point. It makes it so much easier, uh, but you needed to have one of these, an essential item to have that hydromatic, uh, in the first first year or so, it was a very troublesome transmission. A lot of clogs happened through it. Luckily, they used these transmissions in the war, and Cadillac was able to do so much refinement on the transmissions and all the tanks that they were using them in, that by the time we came out of the war, that hydromatic transmission was an amazing transmission. A little bit touchy up until then, uh, especially in the 40s and 41s, uh, in 42, uh, that's when all domestic vehicle production <coughs> stopped, and Cadillac turned to tank production. Not only M5, the M5A1, but also the M24s, those light tanks. Those are Cadillac motors, transmissions, another thing, huge, uh, huge effort. You know, the V16 engines were used in the American submarines during the Second World War. They took the V16 engine, Cadillac, turned it into a diesel, and they were twin V-16 in the American submarine. They had a right V-16, a left V-16. So they used both V-16 engines. 
and turned them into diesel, and that's what they use it. All the American submarines had V-16 engines in them, mm -hmm. but they discontinued them as a Cadillac. Mm -hmm. Well, we can continue on here. In uh, 1946 was the first year that we saw the Dagmars start to show up on the Cadillacs. Actually, they were on the, uh, the bumperettes of the 46. Where that came from, um, I, unfortunately, I was you know, never able to see, <laughs> see uh, this generation of, uh, of Broadway open house. I'd love to look back more onto it. But uh, Virginia Ruth Agnor was one of the cronies that was on this show, and uh, a very, obviously, busty blonde. And uh, Dagmar was an artillery shell shape, and she was nicknamed Dagmar. So when these uh, Dagmars started to uh, appear more and more, they used to, they would grow every year in the cars. Every year they'd get bigger and bigger and more prominent. Other manufacturers couldn't stand that. Why do they, why do they not like it? Because the damage that those Dagmars would do to other vehicles. So in 1957, uh, starting with that Eldorado Brome, they put rubber tips on the end. You know what those were nicknamed? Pasty. Pasty. Yeah. <laughs> pretty wild stuff, pretty racy for the time, I think, back then, in the 40s. Um, but a beautiful woman, and that does look like the front uh, of the 56 Cadillac. Right there. I can verify. Yes, yes. Yep. Uh, 1948, the tail fin years have started. Oh, God. 1948 to 1964, the tail fins, it just, to me, nah, I get I get goosebumps. I just absolutely love everything that has to do with those with those generations. This one, not only the first tail fin, first curved windshield. Even though it was a two-piece windshield, they were curved. Now, in uh, uh, 49, there was kind of a split. Cadillac was also the, uh, working on having a solid one-piece front windshield. So, but I don't think they were the first on that one, but it was within the GM branch. Um, but the the P38 style tail fin that you see here uh, was actually something that was in, uh, to celebrate and reminisce because there was a lot of patriotism about the war at that point. So anything you can do that would just, you know, really kind of bring in a positive aspect of it was a huge success. Um, and just look what it does the lines of the vehicle, just absolutely gorgeous. Um, then in 1949, the birth of the modern day V8. That overhead valve, high compression V8, 331 with 160 horsepower. That now was one of the most amazing motors, desirable motors. Uh, even though it was a high compression, you could still run it on a lot of the gases that they, were, they had back then, and the cars were more efficient. 160 horsepower, not a heck of a lot of horsepower, but how it put that power down the road, it really did a heck of a job. Uh, beautiful motor, beautiful motor. And also that was the first pillarless two-door hardtop. When you have a pillarless, as usually you would have a solid pillar here. <coughs> now it made it want to make it look like it was an open air, open air car, but not, it was a hardtop. Uh, another beautiful, another beautiful example. You can start to see here, you know, we still have the P38s going on there. We still have the two-piece windshield uh, concept car for the Coupe de Ville. Uh, we had one down in Amelia this year. Uh, just absolutely gorgeous, and it was that fullest style. 1950, Cadillac was entered by Briggs Cunningham in Le Mans. Not the first time that a, uh, an American manufacturer uh, had entered Le Mans, but it was, uh, it was a huge success because one of the vehicles that they had was a bone stock 1950 coupe that they had taken off of, uh, off of the production line. And uh, they had straps on the hood, leather straps. I've seen the car. Uh, it's actually it's still in the Collier collection down in uh, down Naples, Florida. They have both of these because Miles Collier uh, and his brother were the ones that raced the stock coupe to build. Briggs Cunningham was the one that drove this one at the moment. The Colliers were the only ones that ever, uh, out of that team, had ever driven the uh, driven Le Mans, and they had suggested to Briggs Cunningham that, that we should keep folding shovels in the car because there's areas in Le Mans if you get off, you need to help dig yourself out. Briggs Cunningham 
poo-pooed the whole idea of having shovels in the cars. 20 minutes into the race, he augured this into a sand bank and spent 25 minutes digging it out with the help of uh, some spectators and finished 11th behind the 10th place car, which was the Collier brothers <laughs> in the bone stock car. What's neat about this car, why I have a lot of love for this car, is uh, this got brought out of, uh, out of the dust a couple years ago, and I was at the Quail in Pebble Beach uh, representing this car as its heritage specialist. And it was, uh, it was made the first time they took a vehicle and they used aerodynamics on it within a race car. The whole wind tunnel was used. It was done in Grumman in Long Island, which is where my grandfather worked during that era. So I was really excited to find out stuff like that. There may be some link. A uh, link to that fact, but uh, Grumman Aerospace uh, had done, done the body on this. It was so ugly that the French press dubbed it Le Monstre. <laughs> <laughs> but it is really neat to see uh, to see in person. Uh, very patriotic color. Both cars were done in an off-white, navy blue with red, uh, nice uh, oxblood red uh, interiors in them. They uh, they have both cars finished. Right on the box. The program was put together about five months before they actually went there. It just it was really, it was a great feat, something very important. Uh, and actually, that was the only time Cadillac entered racing until 2000 when they entered the Le Mans series uh, with the LMP2. First wraparound windshield. And its first signal seeking radio and that electronic eye. That first automatic headlight dimmer came out. S53 Eldorado. Anybody know who that is? I like it. Yep, what, a, what an amazing car. Uh, probably one of the most historic pictures of any Cadillacs using by presidents, which most most presidents did uh, did get their pictures in and used for their uh, used for a lot of parades. They used Cadillacs and still do to this day. Gorgeous car. You can see the dag bars are growing. One piece curved windshield, door sloping down to meet. That was uh, special for the Eldorado. Uh, Still had the overhead valve V8 in it. And that one there has got the uh, chrome wheels, chrome wire wheels. That was the first time a real chrome was used on wire wheels uh, on those Kelsey Hayes wires. Real strong wheel, I mean, it really holds the test of time. But, uh, but just a great picture. There's a couple different pictures of Eisenhower uh, in this car, but this one just is, you know, the victory, the way it is, it's just, oh, it really signifies what Cadillac means to this country uh, and all those involved. And you have our president in, in his inaugural uh, uh, motorcade. Well, not to, uh, to Eisenhower was responsible with Congress in that, in that era for, for creating our national highway transportation system. Uh, before that, we had just local roadways. And everybody had different signs in different states and whatnot. And he came after, after World War II, mm -hmm. seeing what Hitler had done with the Autobahn and said, we could do that here. Yeah, opening up America, and branching everything out. Yeah. Yeah, just so much fun. Um, <clears throat> the different crest of Cadillac, that in itself is a whole another half of the seminar that I could, just, I could uh, talk about all the different elements within a crest. But it does show you that we in fact have all these different crests that have evolved through the years, uh, but they all still come back to the same original principle, which was uh, branched off the original uh, uh, Cadillac uh, the Le Mans crest. The reason I have this up is you may not know, we are, at, we are at Pebble Beach. We are unveiling a new emblem. So, <laughs> could it be good, could it be bad? Uh, I've been told, not much, but I've been told that it is something that they were, they're gonna be able to use the crest uh, to be worked into more of the actual design and body shape of the cars. Uh, from now for the next few years. So, but you know, sure, we don't like change. But look at all the different change we've had throughout the years. So it's not a bad thing. It's a trait of Cadillac, keeping with the times, setting up with the the, the, the crest is with you know, what that current time is is calling for. Art Deco, uh, there is the space age, everything that's going on, they all exist. There. You know what the significance of the waterfall were, the ducks, the. I uh, I can get into. I can go forever on all that stuff. They're, they're called merlets, which were a heralded, heralded bird. Um, and they didn't have feet or wings because uh, for any of youth of that family, it was, a, it was a symbol for them to learn to stand on their own and rise above on their own and not be held up by, uh, by something else. Is that an honor? 
it varies. It's, it's Laurel. Originally, what they were talking about was Laurel in there. Uh, the Merlettes, and then each each of the different colors and panels represent uh, different uh, aspects of the nobility, uh, valor. You know, they can go on and on. The V started to come in, obviously, when uh, the V sixteen, V eight. When the V, the V sixteen, V eight, like that. When Calic really wanted to put out that the V is such a significant thing of the uh, of Cadillac, and then uh, in 1948 they went to just the V8 and uh, the Chevron, which is what it's also known as, as you can see, starts to stay with us. In the 70s we get a little more of an imperial look. 70s literally is a little kind of dark area, and then we got flashy uh, in the early 80s. Reaganomics probably brought that out. Um, and now we're to our current uh, our current crest, which is much more smooth and refined. And we're going to see what's next. So, I want to thank you all for paying attention. It's uh, fun for me to be able to. to, to